Welcome to Uncork Your Mind in this edition of Wine for Vet Street and is for Malbec. We are joined by Veronica Katora of Wines of Argentina and this is truly a fantastic episode. I'm not just saying that. Veronica's enthusiasm is incredible. We talk about Malbec, we talk about Argentina, traveling to Argentina, so this is definitely an episode you don't want to miss. Enjoy. Welcome to Uncork Your Mind, where we take the intimidation out of wine with your host, Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley wine goddess. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Wine for Bed Street. Deb and I are back. We had a little hiatus uh, trying to get a wine uh, for the letter M, but we are ecstatic because yes. today we are virtually, I wish it was in reality, but we are virtually heading to Argentina for the letter M of Malbec. So, hey, Deb, it's been a while. I know, I know. Good to see you. Good to yeah. see you, Veronica. I'm excited yeah. to be back. I've missed, I've missed our monthly chats. Yes, yes. This is our wine education, true education thing, where yes. Deb and I also get to learn, and so it's exciting for us to be back. But for those of you who do not know, I am Lori Bud, one of your co-hosts here. I am a, a Spanish wine scholar, WSET level two. Uh, I am a champagne specialist in the Cote de Ron, And I kind of own a winery, you know, one of those things, uh, in Paso <laughs> Robles, where we uh, specialize in Cabernet Franc. So uh, if you are around in Paso, come on to downtown and uh, give our wine some taste. And Deb, who has a longer list of things that keep her busy. That long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley wine goddess. I'm a wine writer, blogger, educator. I'm a certified specialist of wine, a wine location specialist in port and champagne, and a certified cherry wine specialist. I'm chairperson for the Hudson Valley Wine Spirits and Cider Competition that we just had two weekends ago at the Hudson Valley Wine Fest. I own a restaurant in North Wildwood, Trio North Wildwood. We are open through New Year's Eve. Um, now that it's fall, our hours are just Fridays and Saturdays. And I don't know if I left off anything. Oh, I just became a grandmother. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. Yay. Thank you. I have a granddaughter named Juliet Giaquindo. Oh. So, Yay. Yeah. That's it. Veronica? And Veronica. Veronica. Perfect. Well, for ladies, thank you for having me. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I'm an original, uh, uh, an original Argentinian who actually fell in love with wine uh, during my university studies in Paris in my early 20s. Um, and once I graduated school, I was not in wine, despite my love of wine. I was working with retirement plans, and it wasn't uh, you know, about eight years out of college that I said, this is for the birds. I have to do what I love. I quit my job, uh, got accepted to uh, Insect Bordeaux to get a master's of wine marketing and management. Um, because I was with the French, I love the French, worked with the French for quite a while, really working with Bordeaux as one of my original clients. And then um, I was picked up by my, my, by my people. They found me. They found me working with the French. So um, in my in my role for uh, as for wines of Argentina, I am the U.S. and Canada area manager. Where really my role is to provide wine trained professionals more opportunities to learn about Argentina, the unicity, the diversity of our wines, and just really connect people to our winemakers to the region. And and ultimately, my job is to share my passion of Argentine wine to everybody and hope they get the bug. So, <laughs> and not chill. That's All great. right. Well, I, we are hoping that this webinar helps get that bug out there and get more people to be familiar with it. So we are thankful that you had the time to come on and to share your knowledge with us. Thank you. All right. Um, it's Elmo time, I believe. That's time for us to mute our mics and let Elmo do the talking. Uh-oh. I have it in here. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a month we we there we go
Yeah. All right. Veronica, unmute yourself. <laughs> Audio. Okay. Right, can you, you hear me? Yeah. Got, got me? Yeah. <laughs> We're all good. I said like I want to drink Elmo? with Elmo. I love Elmo. I want to drink with Elmo. I have a story about Elmo. <laughs> You my do. Oh, sure. Elmo for my friend's first birthday when he first came to the stage is Solaria. So Elmo, uh, Elmo is part of our lives. Oh, <laughs> that yay. is great. That, do you have Elmo with you, Lori? I don't because I'm down in Paso and Elmo no. is in Fresno. No. Bummer. <laughs> I so, know. Anyway, let's get it started. Veronica, you touched on how you started and your people found you. Can Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, certainly. As far as I, you know, I was doing um, ed education and, and sales for, for French wine, right? So basically, I worked for a French importer, worked for a French company, doing uh, again promotion and education for a region that's really you know Bordeaux people are not very familiar, especially newer consumers, right? So mm -hmm. um, working with them um, and a company that I had worked for uh, was the Pexa. I, I worked for them for a great many times, and um, Argentina started looking for a representative in the market. And so they reached out to Sapexa and my former colleague, Valerie Gerard, um, said, listen, we got this girl for you who has been doing it for the French and she's kind of one of our own, but she really is one of yours. And so I started working, um, I interviewed with my friend in Argentina uh, back in 2018 uh, and we started working uh, you know, as far as me managing, working the relationships with the importers here in the United States. Um, and after a year and a half during the pandemic, they expanded my role to to uh, work not just with the importers here in the U.S. but the wineries in Argentina, um, as well as expanded my uh, you know my responsibilities to oversee the Canadian market. Where, again, my responsibility is to create marketing programs, um, create opportunities, or uh, you know get connected with opportunities to bring Argentina to the front of the trade, right? And get them whether they be at the some share of mine, as a buyer share of mine. Um, you know, and doing events to get people really, uh, again, educated, excited, and really propel Argentina to, to, to where it needs to be, which is we are a premium wine region. Um, you know, it, it, what we are considered a new world with old world uh, practices, right? And just a ridiculous real estate as far as uh, viticulture. And so uh, I, I, I need to share that with everybody so that they can, um, you know, again, uh, get more excited and start buying more Argentinian wine. So again, um, any programs there are with retailers, with some year conferences, we're there. All right. And so we're here to talk about the, the Malbec. Now, I before we get into this, I just want everybody to know, because you are Wines of Argentina, we want everybody to know that there is more to Argentina than Malbec. So we don't want people to just go, oh, well, all there is is Malbec. It's mighty fine Malbec. <laughs> <But> there, is, <laughs> there is a lot more to Argentina than just Malbec. So, um, but we're just focusing on Malbec today because it's the letter M. It's the month of, of the letter M. And we'll take it. We'll take M. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so you said that you you had a passion for wine, even though you went into, you know, that other realm for a little bit. Yeah. Um, how did you fall in love with wine? Just because you're originally from there, is it that is it yeah. instilled into the culture? Well, first of all, my father, I, I will I will tell you, in Argentina, he was, a, again, even though he was in Malbec, my father was a big drinker of Cabernet Sauvignon, as he would say with his accent. <laughs> and uh, we emigrated in the early 80s um, to uh, to the United States. So wine was part of the culture, but here he would actually make it like a spritzer, right? Just to w extend the utilization of wine, right? So uh, he would have it with dinner. Um, we could, I was drinking it in holidays as a spritzer. Uh, my aunt would pour me, you know, <laughs> some red wine with seven up. And we thought we were really cool. Um, <laughs> never truly appreciated it as a kid and never really longed for it because it was something that was accessible, right? But it wasn't until um, I studied in Paris where I started taking little side trips. I uh, So I would take my first side trip was to the Loire Valley, interestingly enough, which has oh. Malbec. Mm -hmm. um, but I fell in love actually with Bouvray, right? You know, Blanc from, from the region. And then, um, and, and it was a sparkling stuff. It was like more the, the sweeter, the, the demi-sex, you know, what you get started as, as a newbie wine drinker. So it was a great region. 
And then um, from then, one of the, the second or third trip was uh, Dante Nyong. And that is where the love began. Um, I, I'm a right bank Bordeaux girl um, as far as my initiation of love for wine. And so, um, you know, doing these trips, I just fell in love with it, with the industry as a whole. But it wasn't until basically eight years later that I thought that I'm like, heck, I can do something with it. You know, I, I can do something in the industry that I love. So, but it really began just a visit, you know, it was saint the, 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 the region really that, that put the, oh, the, the love. Yes, the that, love is, that is where my heart is in Bordeaux too. Yes, it is. I, yeah. my cheeks hurt when I was there because I just was smiling the entire time and just, it, it is so beautiful there and so historical. And that's where, in, in Bordeaux, that's my heart also. Yeah. And I mean, just a village is so quaint and, you know, yeah. and I think part of wine and, and I'll bring it back to Tina and that it's the culture, right? It's, it's not just the wine, it's the lifestyle, it's the food, it's, it's everything about it. Right. And, and, and you know, so, so it's, it, 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 you fall in love with not just the wine, but everything around it. Absolutely. And that's it, you know, absolutely. And so we're, we're here to talk about Argentina. So b before we get to the wine, which Deb, we didn't clink, but it is 10 o'clock for me. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> My because, you know, I, it, it's somewhere in the world at the afternoon, whatever they right. say, right? What is, it's, yeah, five, it's five right. o'clock somewhere. This is, yes. this is what happens when we yes. take a month off. We forget to clink. I know. So, so <laughs> anyway, cheers, everyone. Cheers. 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 Mm, just the nose. Mm. I, I've had this open a, a little bit, so it's, it's actually it's, this is the well. We, when we'll get to the wine, we'll talk about it. But yeah, this one has to be aerated because it's opening up really nicely now in my glass. Mine, yeah. Mine's been open for an hour. Oh, so. mine I okay. Poured, mine yeah. I poured in the glass a half hour ago because I poured in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 it's because I for, I'm like ooh. And then, this is yeah. nice. All yes, right. It is yeah, a beautiful the only thing I've had in my stomach is yogurt and uh, apples, but <laughs> we're all keeping good. the fruit line. Great. It's yes. all good. It's all good. Yes. <laughs> all right. So before we get into the actual wine, like let's talk about Argentina itself. Where exactly is it? How big is it? Because it's, I mean, it's a cool country of how it's it Designed, designed, right? Yeah. Designed, right? <laughs> we, um, we have a nice little yeah, aspect there. Right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, maybe some fun facts that people can remember about Argentina. Certainly. Well, Argentina is located in the southernmost corner of South America, the South American continent. And it's about, and then, by the way, I have, I, I will speak kilometers and miles because I still don't know kilometers, but it ranges <laughs> about 38 kilometers distance from extreme north to extreme south. That's about 2,300 miles from north to south and about 878 miles east to west. So like the surface itself is about 1.7 thousand square miles. Uh, so so it, that's pretty vast. Uh, we're the eighth uh, largest country in the world, second largest in South America, just following Brazil and the diversity is, I mean, it's, it's as vast as the, the size of the country, right? We go from um, really diverse to ours, uh, natural beauty, you know, warm people, and just a great place to go visit. But those who have, like, never visited Argentina, which I hope everyone hops on the plane, by the way, because the exchange rate is really favorable. So it really is a great time to go to Argentina. Plus, they, we need those dollars down there. Um, it's a country of tango, of the traditional empanada, which to eat and each region has its own much like wine each region has their own empanada uh we are the land of asado wine is our actual national drink go figure wine is the national beverage our national drink so this is why you go if you're a wine lover and of course part of our culture is football football not you know which <laughs> means football <laughs> uh soccer and of course as the champs from the qatar you know world cup last year now we got Messi here in Miami, so we get a little Argentina <laughs> back up in the in the north. No, I was um, rooting for Argentina too because I have a friend from Argentina. Uh, I tell you though, what's disappointing on Saturday? Messi did not play that that Miami Atlanta game. So uh, some disappointed people who paid like two thousand bucks for their tickets. But that's another oh. story. This is what part. Uh, I mean, so basically, we are the land of again. We're talking about the culture uh, before, and I said it's not just the wine; it's the food. For us, it's the culture: the asado, the tango, the football, the wine, the people, the the region. So it's 
it's a beautiful package if you want to have a, a an amazing experience. But you, you have got to get on a plane. It's about twelve hours. Uh, I want you guys are different part of the country, so yeah. for you, Brenda, it, it, it's about a, a it, to get to Buenos Aires is about ten hours, and then another hour and a half to get to Mendoza. Easy peasy. <laughs> piece of cake. A yeah. piece of cake. We all go tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> My bags are packed. <laughs> ready, ready. Yeah. 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 So we, we touched on, um, you know, we're here for Malbec, but what are the other um, grapes grown? You know, there's other grapes grown because I know at the seminar I went to early on this year, I had a great Chardonnay from Patagonia. I was just like, Oh my God, down there, it's so cold, but this is like, and there was very few wines. This was awesome. Yes. Um, we grow, raise yourself, uh, over 200 varietals in Argentina, probably more. We even do Gruner Vent Leader. So, I mean, wow. <laughs> that's a different story altogether. That was a transplant from Austria that got discovered in Argentina. But we have about 200 varietals. The most prominent are the same ones that are here, right? Malbec is our leading grape, but we do Cabernet Sauvignon, amazing Cap Francs, Chardonnay Pinot, um, great sparkling wines. And again, those are blends, right, of Chardonnay Pinot Noir. <laughs> so, like, not a varietal, sorry about that. But we make over 200. We have also Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, um, anything and everything. What it gets most exported, however, is our flagship varietal. But that is not, you know, that's almost um, Malbec itself is as varied as uh, uh, as the country itself. So if I may, when I talk about the grapes, also talk a little bit about the Tuar and why we have so many grapes, if I may. Yeah, that's what I was going to um, say. Like, throughout the whole country, it's just not in one region. Like and I said, right. California, and there's all different areas. Exactly. And just so you have a perspective of this, you know, really vast piece of land, we plant, and again, hectares say nothing to me, but maybe <laughs> something to people, 207,000 hectares uh, of of, of, of vines that we have in Argentina. And we have 28 um, regions that make up the country. 18 of those actually produce wine. And within that, so that's why when you know, we say Mendoza it's like or Patagonia, it's like, wow, there's 18 regions. And within that, it gets even more broad. Um, but we produce wine between, um, the 20, uh, between the 23rd parallel and the mm -hmm. 45th, which for, yeah, you know, and this is for the CSW exam, Brenda, you probably remember this, or for you said, what are the parallels for growing wine 30 to 50? Well, we break the rules. And the reason we break the rules is because um, on the 23rd, what happens is what we lack in latitude, we go up in altitude, which permits us to make that gap, right? And, and produce wines beyond the standard parallels of winemaking. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm getting off tangent here. Uh, when we talked earlier about Salta, not only is it picturesque, it's picturesque because of the mountains, the beauty of these subterranean um, soils that were submerged millions of years on the water that are now peaks of 10,000 feet uh, and higher. And so anyway, so we, so we make, you know, those 23 provinces, 18 of those make wine between those parallels and, and the scenery changes, right? So um, while Malbec is produced all the way from Patagonia, which is in the 45th parallel um, to up to the 23rd parallel, because we're opposite of the hemisphere, right? So when <laughs> it's like this right. versus this, it's sometimes confusing to people, but um, what uh, we, Malbec is the is king varietal, right? Because that's the one that actually has um, it's the, it's the most diverse, uh, most adaptable grape that we have. Um, but in cooler regions like Patagonia, and by the way, the north is also cool, right? We we plant torrontes, and people think, you know, when we, I talked about varietals, I, I skipped our indigenous varietal, which is torrontes, which is. Uh, Known uh, is in the region of Salta, right? Uh, Cafachate, the Cachaqui Valley, um, which is about 6,000 feet above sea level, because uh, we plant in the valleys up that high. Um, there we do Torrontes. In cooler climates, we do Chardonnay, um, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc. So all these, you know, they are representative throughout the entire uh, 18 provinces, if you will, but all representing a different style. What they have in common is where they're planted. Most of the vineyards are planted within those 18 provinces at the foothills of the Andes. I say that, and there's an exception, because they're always an exception, right, ladies? <laughs> so we have the, we have the, the uh, next to Patagonia, that Atlantic region, which is closer to Buenos Aires, closer to the ocean, Mar del Plata, where they're doing new innovative uh, plantings. But again, here, if the climate is very different because it's not as arid desert as we have in, you know, by, 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 
by the foothills of the Andes that we get into more uh, Atlantic. Uh, well, it's an Atlantic climate, right? Because we're right by the ocean. So um, the, it is a very diverse region. So for every grape uh, that is grown, Malbec is in every single region of these 18 provinces okay. along the foothills and the Atlantic. So long answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And, it's and that's more. No, i <laughs> <laughs> and if you do it in the next five seconds, you'll get it. <laughs> That's right. You'll get it. Yeah, no, crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. I don't know, Debbie, did you did you catch it? It's the 23rd parallel, right? So that's yeah. significantly lower than what is typical. Right. So and, awesome. And again, what is so cool, and, and this is a thing that I, I think people, um, once you start dabbling in, you're like, oh, God bless. All what I knew is out the window. There's so much more to know. And again, because the, we're on the Andes, it, it's, it's a tropic of Capricorn where we're actually making wine. So you would think you're closer to the equator, right? right. But you're also in a cooler climate because you're up the mountains at that at that. Uh, that parallel, though, to be very, very frank, we are upwards of, you know, 6,000 feet above sea level, 10,000 feet. And and people that are on the line right now, when I say 10,000 feet, I, I like to give perspective. That is the ding of the plane that says it's safe to use your electronic equipment. That is how high. <laughs> I love that perspective. Right? But, but it's how high we're planting. So um, that's what allows us to go beyond limits. Actually, that should be a tagline, beyond limits. Our next yeah. don't, don't take that. Don't take that. No one okay. on this call. Yeah. I'm going to use that somewhere. I like I like vineyards at the ding of the airplane. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Too. That's kind of funny. Yeah, but it's perspective, right? Like people don't realize because, I mean, unless you're making wine, uh, or you know, really into um, geography and geology and what have you. You don't right. elevation is not something you keep in mind on a daily basis. That is so, true. That yeah. is true. Um, so we have we have three wines that wines of Argentina was generous enough to send us, and so we have um, uh, Susana Balba, which I have had um, the wine before, but not this label. So that was, that was really interesting. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to, to see that. And then, um, so I, I'm not doing them in the correct order, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you can, yep. Yeah. Right. Perfect. And then we have, um, Bodega Argento, mm -hmm. just so the people who are watching, cause we have several people I on today. The first, the first one you want us to taste. This is the first yes. one we're going to taste. Yes. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we have the Alta Vista. Yes. Okay. So that is just, I just wanted to put those labels out there for the people who are watching either live right now or uh, on the YouTube channel so they can actually see these, um, to see these actual labels. Um, but bef we're going to taste them, but I just want to make sure we have time where you can give a little bit of background on each of these these wineries, um, you know, unless you think it might be better to wait till we taste each one when you do it, I just wanted to make sure we gave them their their yeah. time. Yeah, I, I think we can. I can go briefly because we can talk about some of the, the distinctions of it. It's not long. I'm just going to just a brief brief little synopsis of each winery, um, okay. and that way they'll keep more along. And but we acknowledge them, and then hopefully we get to taste them as they're elaborating yes. in the glass right now. They're phenomenal. Um, the, the first one, and, and you know, uh, for those in the audience, we're, we have three different uh, vintages. We have Argentes, our youngest wine, which is a 2021. Then Margo Sin Limites um, is a 2020 vintage. And then the Alta Vista Alba Veneve is 2018. I like to uh, taste in age order when possible, and also because we have different regions. So Argento is uh, in, um, what, in what we call the Primera Zona, right? In, in Luján de Cuyo, which is also a DOC. Uh, we have two DOCs in Argentina and 107 GIs, but we'll talk about it later. But so um, the Bodega Argento, it is a single vineyard, Finca Agrelo, organic uh, Malbec, and it's located in Luján de Cuyo in Alto Agrelo. Um, so I don't have a map, and I apologize, but the ladies will be getting a whole presentation of 176 pages that they can share with everyone who is interested. All right. And uh, Alto Agrelo uh, is, is in Mendoza. It's in the foothills of the Andes at a range of 
3,200 to 3,500 feet, okay. right? Uh, and it's all organic uh, production, uh, organic and sustainable wines. Uh, they were founded in 2012 with the premise of offering the best, uh, the best of the region in a bottle, if you will. And uh, they look uh, for maximum expression of organic vineyards to uh, by careful selection of micro terroirs. And you know, we talked about Mendoza being best, like we have many micro terroirs and we'll get to that later. Uh, but th this wine is also made with minimal intervention to achieve pure organic and classic style. So this one to get perspective, again, Lujan de Cucho, Agrelo, um, the vineyards are from uh, the winery itself from 2012. They make spectacular wine. And, and um, Deborah, when you mentioned the Chardonnay, you most likely had from the sister winery in Patagonia, that Chardonnay. Okay. Uh, oh. from, uh, from, yes, from the region of Chubut, because it's the same group, different wineries. Um, the second uh, wine that we have is Ben Marco, and Ben Marco is from Los Chacaches, uh, which is in the district of San Carlos, in Valle de Uco, Mendoza, right? So we have, the big one is Mendoza, the second, yeah, is Valle de Uco, in the district of San Carlos, in Los Chacaches. So we can be very, very, very precise here. Uh, this is where uh, this winery is coming from, the winemaker is, Eddie del Popolo, oh, amazing guy. He's one of the world's top viticulturals named the Terroir Hunter. Uh, oh. Yes, he's the Terroir Hunter. So if you have ever seen him, uh, you, you, you can refer to him as such. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but Ben Marco, Sin Limites, or Without Limits, it's an organic duck. It's in collaboration with Susana Balbo, the pioneer of, of wine in Argentina. She was one of the, the first... Oh, and not just female winemakers, one of the first leading winemakers to bring, you know, to really work on quality and bring it to, you know, for export. So um, this is a collaboration with her wines and the stands out in league of its own when it comes to soil driven, um, soil driven uh, profile. Um, they use an, again, hands off approach. Um, this wine doesn't have any sulfites. It avoids the space of pesticides or herbicides. So it's really uh, an interpretation of terroir with a very, um, Ha, you know, hands off, clean, truistic, or holistic approach to winemaking in a sense, right? Uh, and again, this one, the, the altitude is about 3,900 feet in elevation. So this is higher than Bodega Argento, right? So we're about 400 feet uh, above uh, the Argento here. And and the last one is Alta Vista. It's located in Campos de los Andes, uh, which is Valle de Uco. Again, Valle de Uco, you're going to hear a lot of it, a lot of wines coming from there, this cool terroir. If you see a bottle with Vache de Uco, you got to get it. Um, Lujan de Cucho, the same. There's some regions that you must know if you want to really get to know Argentina. Uh, stylistically, they're very different, but uh, important for different for different reasons, different aspects that they give to the wine. Um, this wine actually comes from, again, 3,600 feet above sea level, so right in between Ben Marco and Argento, as far as altitude. Uh, but again, these last two, Valle de Uco, uh, different, um, different districts, if you will. But Alta Vista was the first winery to produce single vineyard uh, oh. to wire management. So they are kind of like the, the, the leaders in, in, in that sense. And for them, uh, it's the, the, they look for distinctiveness of sight to express true character to, uh, uh, true characteristics of each region. So um, the vineyard was planted in 1999 in Valle de Uco, and it has, um, a, when we talk about soils, it is loaded. Ladies, I'm telling you, we, we can talk very briefly about soils, but they're so vast. But in, in this particular part of uh, of the region, in, in, in Campo de los Andes, it's, it's deep soil, sandy texture, uh, and mainly rocks. Again, we think rocks because we're at the foothills of the mountains or mm -hmm. on the mountain, if you will. So um, these are some of the, you know, what's interesting about the, these wines and then we can taste together as we, as yes. we move along. Yeah. And if I talk too much, you just, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little cherry. Your, excitement, you notice. your <laughs> excitement and passion is, is, is phenomenal. It's great. Um, so what is the origin of the Malbec grape and how did it end up in Argentina? Yes. And well, I learned something here. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off because this I actually learned something here uh, in, in, in this recently. So, um, but I will, very little is known about the exact origin. To be to be fair, but in 1992, uh, it was discovered that to be a sibling of Merlot. Now, I tell you, I did not know that until very recent, and uh, it has a common mother, uh, Madeleine Noir de Charente, while his father it's Pruneard, like Pruneard Noir, and this is news to me, ladies, to be very fair, which is an ancient um, and rare blackberry that came, that originated from Gayak. I, I don't know if you guys know where Gayak is, but I, I went to their Pochu Verge when I was living in Bordeaux. They have great, sweet oh. style. Like, it's more like a partner to uh, it, 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 the 
they, they have like sweet Southern style, like portrait oh. uh, uh Not that conversation, but it's very neat. Um, but um, the, the, the arrival of the grape itself, it wasn't until the late 19th century um, uh, that, that we kind of, uh, you know, well, actually in the late 19th century that pruneyard was wiped out by phylloxera, right? So um, the grape that's native to the south, it, the Malbec itself is what's native um, to the southwest region of France, more specifically Cahors, which is right, uh, right by Bordeaux, and it's known as Cot. It's a different, it's not the same Cot that you find in the Loire Valley, by the way. It's, it's probably a sibling. I don't know much about the Loire Valley uh, Malbecs, but again, it, this comes from the south of the region of Cahors, uh, and it's known as, uh, as Cot. So very, very cool, you know, history in a sense, especially that it comes from Pruneyard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just happy because it's kind of like, I call it the stepchild of Cab Franc because I need to relate everything to Cab Franc. So mm-hmm. it's kept because, because the, you know, Cab Franc was the parent of Merlot. It's the same mother, you know, that gave us caught, which gave us Malbec. So I have, I, you know, if I can weave a way back to Cab Franc, it makes me very happy. Oh, then you got to try some Camp Franc from Argentina, too. I know that you're I making would them pasta rollers, but you really got to discover it there for now. I would love to. Yeah. I'm not okay. sure we get you some samples. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll hold you to that. I'll hold you to that. Um, so, Deb, do you know, Deb was starting to say about how do you, do you, how did it get to Argentina? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And that was my fault for interrupting you. <laughs> I like that. I got so excited. About I got so, you got so excited. It's good. It's I good. jumped right in. Uh, well, actually, according to research, um, Cahors where Malbec actually originally was grown, right? Now, but according to tradition, the vine entered um, the region through the second century, about 150 AD from Italy. Now, it was introduced by the Romans, right? This is what we kind of... Uh, the, put together through the research. Now, although we have to consider it may have come from other parts of Europe, right? So again, it's not not very clear, but we know it was introduced by the Romans, or we, we think most likely was introduced by the Romans. Um, but it really was uh, the, the varietal that um, it was in Cahor where it really was cultivated, right? And where it acquired recognition, um, considerable recognition by um, the writers and the kings at the time. But it wasn't until 1853 that it made its way uh, on the timeline to Argentina. And it was introduced by a French agronomist it's called Michel Pouget. And he was hired by the Argentine national government to oversee the management of our Quinta Normal of Mendoza, which is an agricultural quinta, right? And his role was to really uh, lead in um, the education and planting and, and, and vitification of French varietals in Argentina. And Malbec was a major French varietal, right? It still is. It's not used as much in France, but it was one of the border ones, right? Uh, the, the, so um, it was introduced officially in 1853, and that links into why we celebrate Malbec World Day, because Michel Pouget was actually appointed on April 17th, and so by April 17th, it's Malbec World Day for us. And um, for us, it grew really well. But what's interesting to know is 10 years after it became our official, right, um, official um, varietals that had were cultivated in Argentina. Um, in 1863, we have phylloxera hit France, right? So um, huge wiped out vineyards in France and throughout the world. Um, but what, what happened to us is crickets, literally crickets. Because we have natural barriers, the Atlantic Ocean to uh, to one side and the Andes on the other, we were exempt from phylloxera. Now, we weren't the only one at Cyprus, Chile, and Argentina. Because of our natural barriers, were immune in, at the time to phylloxera. So we have what we call pre phylloxeric Malbec. So we have the original because the originals were wiped out, right, through phylloxera okay. in Argentina. So uh, the timing of how Michel Pouget and, and, and the, the government really worked together to 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 define agriculture in Argentina, uh, they, we, it, in essence, made us now have the original. So we are the original Malbec. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as as kind of a comparative aspect of it. How would you describe, and I know this is a difficult question because yeah. within Argentine, in Argentina, they vary so differently, which I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask a sidebar question here. Sure. Is it Argentinian or Argentine? What, what is the correct way to 
group people to, and grapes together? It's funny. You know, for years I've had the same question, but for wine, I just say Argentine wine. Argentine. I say Argentinian okay. for the for the for the individual for the person. Like I would say, I'm okay. Argentinian, but the 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 thing would be Argentine, like Argentine wine, or okay, vino, vino argentino, even better. Okay. Oh, that I can do. Vino Argentino. I can do that. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So Argentine wine, Argentinian people. people. Okay. So the I know it's difficult because Argentine Malbec is different and we'll get to experience this in, in a minute, but how would you generalize Argentine Malbec versus the French Malbec or, or Cote? Or even how about us in California, our Malbecs compared to? Uh, okay, Th this is a very, like, like you said, very complicated question. As far as with, with France, it's uh, it's more mineral structured as fear. But our Malbec is um, in, in Argentina, Let, let's go this way because our climate is very different and we'll get to it in, in a little bit. Um, Malbec is, uh, we have a lot of variety, a lot of intense color, shades of deep violet, um, aromas of red fruit, plums, cherries, you know, I'm just generalizing here, right? So it's not, because when we get to region and I, it's very specific. Um, and so you have notes of plums, cherries, spices, minerals. And with oak aging, you bring out some chocolate, vanilla, tobacco flavors. And, um, you know, it, it, the mouth is like soft and persistent with sweetness and tannins. So <laughs> it's very broad. But um, in, since 2000, what well, we Argentine producers have begun to focus on origin to give identity, um, you know, to give more a better understanding and interpretation of the Malbec itself. So we have had Malbec studies where they uh, about 18 or 20 wineries from north to south, uh, pretty much grew the, the vines and um, treated them in the winery the same way, and and they discovered really that they're all different. Um, sorry, there's a fruit fly in my office because I have. <laughs> because you have. Argentine my wine, oh my yeah. God. Argentine wine. <laughs> and so um, what they determined that each region stylistically is different. So cooler climate for us, and this is where you in California or Loire, I guess cooler climate, um, Malbec may be more similar to Loire Valley, uh, okay. maybe because it's cooler climate. Um, so a little more brightness, more refreshing acidity. Uh, that when you get to warmer regions or uh, regions where it's more uh, clay in the soil, they're richer, they're bolder, they're, uh, I like to say costo, right? It's a French word, like meaning, you know, they're, they're more built. So it really, I, I would I can't answer that in a very straightforward fashion because they're as varied as the soil that they're planted in and the altitude that they're planted in. And, and so, but um, we, again, it's, uh, it's it, well-made Malbec tends to be dark perfumed wine with, you know, blackberry and plum fruit. But again, it's at h and because it ate in barrels, it's at h and concrete. Right. And right. so you're a winemaker, you know, you know, you know, like, it's, <laughs> like, guys, I know you want the answer. I can't give it to you. You got to drink a lot of Malbec. It's all different okay. between where you get it with the soil and the climate. And yes. The yes, 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 yes. You know Just, what happens okay, so, in during the vinification process, so. Well, it's less about the vinification process itself. It, 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 it's more about the soil. It's a terroir. We are mountain people. And if you ask a lot of winemakers, they, 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 they make mountain wines. And so when you take Mendoza, so, so again, this is kind of to try to answer a question that has no simple answer and just to give you more depth of why Argentina and why you want to take a deep dive without me here, because there's so much to know. And I just I just touch the surface because I myself know the surface. Right. Um, but within Mendoza itself, there's about five regions, just Mendoza. So you have uh, Valle de Uco, which is the, the premium, right? What they call the premium. Primera Zona, that's just where you find Luján de Cuyo and Maipú. Very different uh, soil types, very different climates because they're very different altitudes. Um, and then you have the northern oasis, the east and the south. And so um, when you talk about soils, because we are in the Andes, and this is, again, for a geologist, is a gold mine, um, you know, we have a lot of alluvial soils. And for those people that are listening that may not know what alluvial soils are, it's soils that are created by drags of river and ice melt. And um, as the water descends the mountain, it leaves around sediment. And it's millions of years of run, right? Of uh, even on a daily basis, a run of different water. And we have colluvial soils from the windstorms that came about. So what happens in the Andes mountains and within these regions, you have different cones that are, and I, and I shape them this way, right? And each cone have a different soil composition. 
So what's happening today when you're planting a vineyard, instead of doing a square, for example, like planting in a line, they're, they've done thermal studies, so they're planting along by soil type, right? So, um, it, yeah, it, I, again, I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's what's happening in Argentina. And, and I mean, you, you know, to, to answer the question about um, Argentina and California, you know, you take an elevation in Mendoza, right, as well. You know, take the soils aside. We know they're diverse. They're heterogeneous. You can be five feet away and have a different soil type, right? And that's what's so cool about the region. <laughs> Uh, you have, you know, 14 in Mendoza is 1,400 feet to 6,000 feet of elevation. Napa, the highest point is 2,600 feet, right? And that's uh, uh, that's Atlas Creek. Now, for people that are really wine geeky here, because I love talking about altitude, because I, I understand it. Like, after all these years, I get it. <laughs> for every, like, time you go up the hill, like about three, it's 155 meters, which is 328 feet. You, you go up that mountain a Celsius degree drop in temperature occurs. So you already jumped a, a different climate, right? So when you're talking about elevation beyond 2,600 feet or anything about 3,000 feet or 3,600 feet, now you have UV exposure that is impacted up the mountain, right? So I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm deflecting here, but what's happening is when you, uh, the, the higher you go up the mountain, not only you get cooler, you get higher concentrations of soil, of uh, radiation, but that stops at, I believe, at 3,000 meters, the studies show. And what happens is that grape gets really dark um, to protect the juice inside and so the, the, the um, to protect the berries. So you have um, really dark, intense fruit, uh, but since you're in cooler climate, higher acidity. And th that's not something you can achieve in, in Napa, for example, when you're just, the peak is 2600, right? So when you start understanding the climactic differences, mm -hmm. the exposure, the grade at which you are in the mountain, because depending what side of the mountain I'm going to move my body to, like that's the, the exposure of sun you're going to get. So. Um, another thing to take into consideration about this style and how it impacts, you know, Argentinian versus California, or more specifically Napa. In Argentina, we're an arid desert. The, 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 we get less than eight inches of rain per year. Oh, wow. Okay. We have to irrigate. In Napa, you get an average of 23 inches per year. So, again, that comparative, the, all I, it, it, instead of answering how are they alike is, and how many ways are they different? Right, right, <laughs> right. And right. and so again for us, and the with the water source, uh, our water, our irrigation is snow melt from the Andes. Everything is natural, right? There's um, th there is like a full circle in Argentina of this. It's it's a whole again holistic, but again everything is, it, it, it's more the more we you know we're just very stylistically different that we can find, uh, in specific regions. Uh, you know, similar uh, similar profiles, but that's why it's the world to discover. Like, that's why you got to go down there and like lick some rocks as some winemakers do. <laughs> All right. All right. So I, I think it's about time we start to taste. Yes, I'm so yes. sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, so we're starting out with the um, Bodega Argent Argentina. Argento. 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 Yeah. So cheers, ladies. Slancha. Mm. Salud, we say salud. Oh, or chin chin. Okay. Salud, chin chin. chin. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one, nice. I, so this much beautiful. I, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the wine. I'll let you ladies talk about the wine. I, I talked a lot about the region. I'm going to enjoy what you talk. <laughs> the spices is, is yeah. so strong. The baking spice is yeah. incredible. And, and this wine that that came to, we were talking about the, the altitude of this wine. Uh, th this one, uh, what did I say? Was just about oh, I, I, again that fruit fly. It's really distracting me, and I apologize. I usually don't have fruit flies in my office. <laughs> was this the 20, <laughs> 2600? Is that what you said? Yeah, this one is uh, between uh, Argentos between thirty two hundred feet oh, this is the to thirty five hundred feet above sea level. Okay. But this one is the one that's located in Luján de Cuyo, which is what we call refer to the Primera Zona. So, you know, it, it's crazy when we talk in Argentina about regions. Um, you know, we say Valle de Uco is more precise than Primera Zona because in Primera Zona, we actually, we, we have two others. Well, actually, Valle de Uco has many other subregions, but um, this is the one where uh, you're going to find the, the, the more, um, and now this is an organic wine, by the way, sustainable organic. It's made in a different way than the other wines are, are made. But usually you have that rounder, uh, I, I feel like more, um, yeah, the beautiful fruit, right? At the same yeah, time, yeah. like it's yeah, just, yeah, absolutely. elegant. Sometimes, sometimes to me, um, Malbec, can, um, it can be rough 
rustic. Yeah. That's a better word. Yep. Rustic. This is got all of that spice that typically for us then leads to that rusticness that is either a, depending on your opinion, positive or negative. Um, this is, doesn't have that rusticness. It's followed by the fruit versus yes. that, uh, you know, earth that can be there. Yeah. What you know, does what is retail mm -hmm. for in the States? Oh my God. Don't ask me this question. Cause I do not oh, have the pricing. Sorry. I would not know, you know, and I'm so sorry. Um, would probably have to Google it. Cause I don't know also if it's in okay. every market, I know it's available. Okay. Um, that I would not know, and each market would be different. But okay. so we're getting to a premium category, like an ultra premium. premium. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I do well along those lines. I do want to do a shout out to the wines of Argentina themselves, the um, and the website. Uh, so can you just before we forget, yes. can you just give that website because there's a wealth of information on yes. that website. Huge. Yes, it's winesofargentina.org. Org and there is a there's a blog there and they're very relevant if you really want to get nitty gritty there's some fun stuff like what restaurants to hit what wineries to visit uh, that's nice and cool but there's really good uh, blog content about the varietal about the aging of Malbec about uh, what and it's really well done but we have really great content creators and these are knowledgeable people about wine um the two individuals i'm gonna give a shout out to alejandro Vigil, uh, Vigil, alejandro and i'm not gonna say the last name and joaquin um both are brand ambassadors or when i when i say brand ambassadors they're wine professionals and um they they just have a, a amazing they're they're tied into the wineries um they're you know extremely knowledgeable and they they dump the information in such a way that makes it very understandable and they're not not they're not talking at you they're talking to you which for me that's the big thing in wine right like you want people to like the wine if you talk out on that you know right and so but yeah wines of argentina.org um great information um there's downloadable presentations as well if you want to go by region so if you go to where there's varieties they give you information um by region you if you want your own presentation i'm going to send it to you ladies just so that you have it all together because it's one right. instead of having five different downloads um but it's great great information and if you want to, you know, even food pairings are, are there as well. So it's a great site. Great. So we have, we have, um, actually, we have several people um, uh, watching, but Michael was wondering, and I'm thinking that maybe he can find his answer on the website. He was looking for some other winery uh, suggestions or, you know, the labels, the wineries themselves from the Salta, from the Salta province. So yes. is that a searchable thing on that site? Yes. When you go to winesofargentina.org, you hit on the northern region, you hit on Salta, and then they'll give you all the wineries that are out there. What's really interesting about this region, um, thank you, Michael, for the question, is that there are not as many wineries as there are in Cusho, which is basically our prolific you know, wine region. 75% of the, the wine produced in Argentina, or 85 of 85 of it comes from Cujo. Um, it's for the export market, it's only 3% from the Patagonia and the north. So, uh, but uh, there's not a lot of wine because they're higher altitude. It takes it's harder to grow, the yields are less, but they have a spectacular wine. So, if you get a Malbec from the north, um, try it out there. And again, they, they're just very deceptive when you see them because you, you think they're going to be really, really big because they're so dark. Um, but um, they're going to be really refreshing. So, um, but they are listed on the website. It is a great source. Sorry, right. I went long. That's okay. <laughs> no, well, we're going to, we're going to go on to wine number two. Perfect. Oh, the Ben yes. Marco. The Ben Marco. Oh yeah. And this one was the one that's actually higher than uh, the Bodega Argento that we just had. So this is from Los Chacalles. In Valle de Uco, uh, but in the district, which is but the district of San Carlos, so it's Los Chacaches, which is within San Carlos, and so this is higher altitude than the Argento, and uh, it's and darker. Yeah, it's, it's right, right. Again, I mean, that, that, I'm going to do this, but people on on watching aren't going to be able to see it. But oh, it is, I might be able to. Well, you know, when I when I'm putting it in front of my white paper and my words, yeah. I can basically read. You really can't tell. Yeah, yeah, it is intense. It's an intense yeah. color. Yeah. Yeah. You can, I can see my words on my paper through the Argento and I, I can see there's something. 
um, behind oh, yeah. the uh, Ben Marco, but I can't read the actual letter. So this is a, this is a darker Malbec. So as we taste the Ben Marco, can you talk to us about any uh, dishes that that you know wine and food pairings that will go well with Malbec? Oh my gosh, everything and anything. There, and that one I can direct you to the blog as well. That it, it, in a very short sense, it go, we do uh, anything from asado, which for if you're not familiar, because I didn't really explain, asado is our Argentine grill. We throw all the cow on the fire and eat it up. I mean, so it's it, it, amazing with chimichurri, but we can do asado, pasta, pizza, tamales, humitas, um, humitas, uh, empanadas, sushi. Like we have wines that go with sushi because whether it be a Torontes, for example, doesn't have to be a Malbec. Um, so depending on, again, back to that regionality, the style of the wine is comparable, with, but we do have this food and wine pairing on the Wines of Argentina blog. So when you go to the winesofargentina.org, hit on the blog and do food pairings and shoop, there you, you go. Will, you, okay. you will have all the, higher acid. all the answer. And higher acid Cooler in climate. this wine. You yep. Higher acid in this wine. And I get more... I get a lot of cinnamon. Yeah, um, and it, it's it's very different from the first. Yeah, so different it's, from the first. The first had a little bit more fruit to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, are you are you? Mm. Am I the only one getting cinnamon? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, really I, yeah, I I I I'm not. I'm you know. As they say, you know, I, I don't. You probably you're probably right. Um, um again, for me, it, it's uh, right today. I, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, doesn't mean it's not there. Like, <laughs> look, I just yeah. tell you. Well, every palate's different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What are, what are you but getting? They do say for? women, they do say women have a better nose, by the way. We do. We a do. I've palate. written a blog scientifically proving it. So ah. I, 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 I do get, it's, it's just a, a hint on the finish. Okay. But it's very interesting because the, to me, I, it's a very distinct difference in acidity level mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. me. And I'm, this is, it's, it's not like it's out of balance acidity. It's it's beautiful acidity, but it's a different. This is a completely different wine. The aromatics are completely different. Yes, completely. Um, you know, I get a I get a plum in here, um, but uh, what stands out is the the color difference and that acidity. This is this is um, livelier because because yeah. that acidity is right up there. Yeah. Yeah. This is content meeting reality, right? We were talking about higher altitude. It's really darker, but it's refreshing acidity. Like, you're, yeah, it's it's in the bottle, and it and it's so right. It's in the bottle. Yeah, the bottle. Yeah. And what I like this isn't when you when you think about red wine. A lot of times, people think it's heavy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This wine yeah. isn't heavy. No, mm -hmm. not at all. Mm -mm. You know, this. It, and, and like in summertime, I, I personally shy away from like a cab, a Merlot. It's just with the heat, it's just too hot. This, Malbec's are nice summer wine. This is very nice. Yeah, and I think it's, again, it's all that acidity, the cooler climate. Yeah. And again, not to say that one region is better than the other. It's stylistically, they're so different that you can consume Malbec every day and not not, not affect the surface, right? Because um, not just the, it's aside from the GI or the soil, it's the winemaker. So you can have comparable soil types, different winemaker who's a different interpreter of the terroir, and, and you're going to get that different wine. But one of the things I've learned, too, in, in my journey of loving wine <laughs> As a big wine consumer, uh, yeah, they're not all, you know, it, it, it's it's very, uh, we think because stylistically in warmer climates, we have bigger wines, but we are warmer climate with cooler regions. And we, we don't think about that. That makes it, ah, oh, I can have a great wine. That's And that acidity makes it food friendly, right? Yes. That refreshingness. So um, there's some wines, you know, it's particularly Lujan de Cusho, not, none of them here. They're like, it's like one and done kind of thing. Because they're, but um, those are more age worthy wines that we don't age, but uh, they, they are, they can be light mm -hmm. in a sense, light and, mm -hmm. and, and, and bush, right? I mean, very well structured, but it's yeah. just, it's not that. Heavy. It's not, it's not a heavy, full bodied wine. Yes. It, you, it's, yeah. it's a medium palette, almost a medium minus palette. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's got all the fruit. It's got the flavors, got the acidity. Um, and it's not 
screaming it in it your has face. Nice it's texture. Not, yeah, it's not bullying you. In yeah. Case. I love that. Not bullying you. I, I'm going to use that. I am going right. to use that. I got <laughs> it. I, 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 if that's okay, I will trade Absol <laughs> Absolutely. So as we move on to bottle number three, um, so this Alta Vista, which is very cool, has a nice little diagram there on the back. Can you talk about um, are clones something that are important? in Argentina, like, you know, we know that like oh, wow. war lives on the fact that, oh, it's this clone, this clone, this clone, you know, um, but is it, is it a big deal? In no, that, no. And the simple answer is no, but I can, I can, I can give you, I can elaborate on that, by the way. So starting in the nineties, INTA carried out a clonal selection um, and several, they achieved several clones like uh, NB9 INTA, B12 INTA, you know, you're a winemaker, so you're more familiar with clones. I Me, mean, not so much. So for me, this is interesting, but I, 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 don't, I don't know how, you know, but um, so, but they're not commercially available in nurseries, what they found, right? Um, and then the Mercier, uh, again, we have a lot of French people through Mercier, Nursery in Mendoza, they've developed a clonal selection. Uh, which we assaulted in again for winemakers and clone 136, 501, 505, 506, 1713. Um, but that all was obtained starting in 2010. So, um, the only the latter ones can be commercially um, found, and uh, other companies have also developed their own clonal selection, like Catena and Tempest Alba. But, uh, in some cases, uh, it refers to clones, especially foreign ones like Cat, if they were different uh, from a local variety of Malbec or Argentine selection. Basically, the, the study suggests that from 19, eight samples taken from 89, 20, 2003, 2014, um, the local material, actually, our natural land, if you will, uh, Argentine Malbec and French Cat are exactly the same strain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was agreed that the case of Pinot Noir, there are there are differences. But for us, it's more the local material that has a greater impact on the varietal itself than the clone. That's so, interesting. Yeah, 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 that is very cool. So, Deb, what do you think of this one? Oh, I haven't tasted it yet because I let my dog in, so, and then uh, you had to let your dog out, <laughs> and, and then I had to let her out because it just wasn't working. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were, yeah, the dog. Uh, ooh, ooh, sorry. No, Damn. she's just yeah. so, she's very um, needy. She doesn't like to be alone. Mm. And and she sees wine. She may be thirsty. Yeah. And, so, yeah. um, again, this is a completely mm. different wine again. Very different. Again, well, we're here again. We're in Valle de Uco, uh, same as uh, the Ben Marco, right? It's Valle de Uco, but this is uh, different. This is slightly lesser, um, lower down the mountain. Outside. We said what it was about 30 up to 3,900 feet um, in uh, the Ben Marco. This is about 30, an average of 3,600 feet. Um, single vineyard production, um, you know, single vineyard uh, management uh, type of soils are a, a little bit different. Um, and it has some age, it's a 2018. So, yeah. and not but organic. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Right. Now, it's the what oldest, is the but... ageability, and I might be going out of uh, our order, but of Malbec. Oh, oh, I missed the question. Where, so what, what is the ageability? Because this is, you know. Oh, ageability. Well, here we go. The, the way that we, the way the varietal is, each wines have an ageability, and I'm going to send you a link uh, to that to not be ad nauseum. But our wines, because of their high acidity, and uh, um, because again, even in Luján de Cusho, you have um, the cool climate. These wines, most Argentinian wines, are age worthy. They can go anywhere from, and I have a chart too uh, that I'll share with you ladies later on. Um, most of these wines are age worthy wines because of their natural acidity. Um, of, of, of how they are made, uh, but they've made studies, and I'm trying to look at my notes here. Um, they did a, a study on the on the aging process, and it was observed that uh, over time, uh, aging is a significant factor that affects the phenolic compound profiles studied in Malbec. Yeah. So after five years of aging, the wines could be differentiated among regions. So each region, because again of the microclimates themselves, to they are they are worthy of aging, but you have wines that have an aging, um, like wines that are like more structured, what you call the racy Malbecs with dark fruit and notable acid. 
um, that may be chewy. Uh, those who have a tendency to age 10 to 20 years, um, Malbec that are dark fruit uh, and some acidity or juiciness, moderate tannins, um, obviously some oak aging, they can age seven to 11 years. And and even the, those younger wines, there's some one you can drink now and even age up to five years. So the, the phenolic compound and structure of the varietal itself, it lends itself to aging. It's just not something that we do with a new world, right? It's something that we as consumers have to get around like, Yes, you can age a new world wine, which we know we age in the old world. So why wouldn't we translate that, right? So right. they're very worthy. So this has my, still some. This has nice acidity to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say it's it's the oldest is 2018, but I think it's got the biggest tannin structure. It's it's yeah. the biggest mouthfeel uh, of them. So kudos on choosing the order. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it was uh, as I say, it was by luck because I'm like, this is very difficult. Uh, you know, age aging is the way that I like to do it typically. But um, again, stylistically, it was being gone. But that was by luck, sheer luck, ladies. I'm not, I'm not gonna <laughs> let, let me. I'll be very transparent. Better to be lucky than good. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. I'm very lucky. <laughs> so um, this is going to be a loaded question, also. But um, typically. Is there a general way that Malbec is processed? Do we typically see it in oak? Are they experimenting with different types of oak? Do they like French oak, Hungarian oak? What what are they? Or even cement. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, all, yeah, of, all, the of, the all, all of the above. All of the above. All of the above. And it goes to who is the winemaker. Uh, we have winemakers, that, a lot of French winemakers. Um, and even you know, in Argentina, typically, it's French oak used over American okay. and, and the majority of wineries. That being said, we have the kefirs, we have the concrete tanks, we have we have it all, and there are particular winemakers. The the vinification process it's similar globally, right? There's not too much variation of in vinification in the process of the winemaking. It's just how it is aged or not aged, or how it's stainless steel tanks. Um, you have winemakers again interpreters of terroirs. That's that's why I like to call them. Some of these guys just really want to be true to this. this the place that 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 micro microcosm of their vineyard, and so um, they will age in stainless steel or concrete to make sure that they give um, that they don't uh, harness or give any outer elements to the wine. So it's all of the above. And then you have these French wineries or even more traditional wineries that love to use the French oak to give some nuance, you know. But um, again, it, it is a unique uh, individual winemaker decision. And it doesn't follow a straight line. It's really um, the winemaker at the helm of that winery, right? And if, uh, you know, it also becomes, you know, tradition because if they have to rechange, you know, uh, their, you know, everything to concrete or vice versa, it's an investment. So it, it's a gradual process for many of these wineries if they do change. So um, because it's capital investment, right, to, to make it practical. But everything under the sun the methods are, are being done i love to see the eggs they're really cute <laughs> different size <laughs> eggs uh yeah. but uh yeah no uh, we, uh, it's a very winery specific again as diverse as uh, as the terroir we have in argentina and as excited as we want to get you to go there and visit and see that you know we are more than malbec and we are malbec and then some and then right. some within the malbec <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then some in the malbec <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So Are there Go ahead. any concerns when it comes to Malbec? Like, so we've talked about how the winemakers are doing it, but is is Malbec prone to anything? Are they? You actually kind of already answered that because yeah. the way your geography is and your topography, you're pretty much naturally protected. We are. We it's very. Uh, we have very low. Fertile. I mean, we really stress the vines by nature, right? We don't we don't get the rain uh, to get to to have um, fungus, right? <laughs> to do have, right? we we don't have uh, we have our natural barriers in the Atlantic, which or the Pacific or in Patagonia, which we haven't talked about. The winds are so strong coming off the Atlantic. They any pest or louse it can get on the vine gets blown away. <laughs> it's blown to face. Uh, it really does. So um, we are very fortunate to have really poor soils. Right, they, they need the, the vine needs to thrive, and um, the elements. The only the biggest risk for us is frost, and that's when you go up and out. That's the risk that you have. But other than that, you know, um, the, the soil is so poor 
which is so rich for us, uh, that we don't we don't have that concern, right? Uh, we have naturally protected land in a sense um, given to us by nature. And, and, you know, you, one of the things that I find interesting is people sometimes ask about global warming. Well, we're going up the mountain. So, in a sense, we're trying to mitigate in a natural way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, finding cooler climates and uh, interesting um, ways to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say plant, but uh, higher ways to plant and, and to, to manage the vineyard. So, uh, not really a concern for the, our the particular part of the world. Thrive. Make the grapes, the vineyards yeah. thrive. Right. Yeah, 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 and and again, you know, the Atlantic is a little different because they're closer. Obviously, we're closer to water, so different impacts. So, but those are exploratory areas, right? So, I mean, but uh, no, no, no main concerns because we're so blessed to have such you know great terroir. Wonderful. Yeah. So, if someone um, is looking to explore Malbecs for the first time, mm. how where would you direct them? Okay. Well, let, let's see. I, I have. Let, let, I'm gonna look at my notes here because every depending on the region, you have again. Um, you you have like a different an introduction to Malbec. You know, somebody oh, that's I mean, new that that does not. You know, you know. I, I mean, I'm gonna say that the Oregon first place to go. Where would yeah, you, you know, from Mendoza. You go to Mendoza. Mendoza. You go to the Primera Zona. You go to you you go to Primera Zona and you go to Lujan de Cucho and taste some wines from any of the wineries, and you're gonna have big, big uh, rounder Malbecs. And then you go down to Valle de Uco, where you're gonna have go to any winery down there. They're all different, um, and explore a different style, like cooler climate, higher acid uh, Malbec. Uh, but every region has something to offer everyone. And if you don't have time to go to the regions, you go to there's a and I Escapes my mind. You go to it's a oh my god what Aldo's. I'm I'm giving a plug to a restaurant that we work with in Argentina who has pretty much every wine on the planet. Or well, you go to Don Julio's, which have amazing cellar, and you go there and you say, "Show me some wine." Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's better than show me the money. That's right. Like, okay, I don't think you need to show the money to get those wines. But uh, no, but it, it really is. Uh, there is something from everybody um, in Argentina. There truly is. And for the new wine drinker, again, it's, it's just a Mendoza and Mendoza Malbec will do. Again, it's a place to explore, and no region must go untouched, really. So if you have time, you should taste the 170 oh, I like that. No <laughs> And the two DOCs. So we'll start there. All right. So so what's the best way to travel to Argentina? Like, oh, you gotta, you gotta fly, fly out in, there. Where would you fly into to get to like Mendoza and, and Two area? ways, uh, two possible ways from the United States, I say for those, nor uh, for those North Americans. Uh, so either you go in through uh, Chile, uh, and you fly from Santiago to Mendoza if you want to go to the wine region, or you fly from the U.S. to Buenos Aires. There's no direct flights to either Patagonia or um, or or um, or Salta, so you have to everything through Buenos Aires. So when you want to come down to Argentina from the U.S., first stop is Ezeiza. Take a flight to Ezeiza to Buenos Aires, and from there you take another flight to Mendoza um, or you, the, the other regions. But you got to fly. Uh, there are direct flights from New York to Buenos Aires. I'm in Chicago. There's no direct flight. I either gotta go through Dallas or Miami, get myself to Buenos Aires, and then get myself on a plane down to Mendoza. So uh, it's a bit of a jumper, uh, but worth it. Especially, you know, again, the wineries uh, they treat they they treat their guests so well, and the wines are just fantastic. And just again, like I said earlier, the the exchange rate is the time to go is you know. Um, I think I'm now you really and work that into my off my downtime this. Winter, which is your summer. Well, which is yes, it is. We're opposite mm -hmm. climate, right? So, you know, yes. Christmas is in the summer over there. So, um, yeah. right now it's right now it's fall here. It's spring there. Oh, no, it's not fall. What are we, we technically yeah, we're, we're fall. Fall. getting close. It's officially fall. fall. Almost fall. Well, it's spring days. there. Fall is Friday. <laughs> it's it feels birthday. like fall here. Oh, well, happy birthday. Thank you. It's a big one. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> oh, cheers to that. Cheers. Yeah. Mm. Well, Veronica, I want to thank you for taking the time and coming on and sharing the wines and your knowledge and your expertise on wines of Argentina. And I want to thank everybody who came in and uh, watched live. And, you know, you know, this is all going to get converted into the podcasts uh, on both of our channels and YouTube on both of our channels, yeah. plus Wine for That Street. 
You always can go to wineforbetstreet.com and see the videos there. Um, but I just want to thank you. The, the wines were incredible and it truly was like traveling through the glass because each region had a very distinct, you know, experience that the Mal, the Malbec was very different within each one. And I love the fact that a single grape variety can express itself differently in the different regions. So thank you so much. Yes. And, and your enthusiasm, I mean, is you can't get that anywhere. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if anything, anybody can get from this, this whole webinar is taste, go taste a Malbec, pick up a Malbec, start, if you're new to Malbec, start with Mendoza. If you want a, a little bit more higher end Malbec, go to Valle de Yuco, and I'm, I, I suck at pronunciation, um, and explore the wines of Argentina because there's a lot more than just Malbec. Um, although the show is based on Malbec, but you know, Argentina wines are really wonderful. And thank you. So I did thank save you, a little bit for our final goodbye. Thank you so much, Veronica Cheers. and Slanka. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Chin, chin. Salud. Bye. Gracias. You Bye -bye. too. Take care. Bye-bye. Chin. Wasn't this episode amazing? Veronica was just incredible. Her enthusiasm and excitement over Argentinian wine is just incredible. Makes you want to go hop on a plane and visit Argentina tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed the program. I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. And you can find me on HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, or now it's called X, on Threads. Um, on YouTube, and I hope you leave a um, comment and tell me how you enjoyed this episode of Wine for Bed Street, and we'll see you next time.